over there and going, man, there's not enough people on stage. What? I'm preaching. So like, will that be, will that throw it off? Whatever. So I don't necessarily have any dad jokes. Um, I have a few anti-humor jokes. If anyone knows what those are, they, they sit kind of close to dad jokes. Um, I'll go ahead and just tell one and then we'll move on. Um, why did the squirrel fall out of the tree? Because it was dead. Why did the sec... <laughs> Why'd the second squirrel fall out of the tree? It was stapled to the first squirrel. Why'd the third squirrel fall out of the tree? Peer pressure. Moral of the story, don't give in to peer pressure. All right. So that's my uh, attempt at dad jokes. Uh, I love, I don't know about you guys, but I love being able to be a part of a church that can do the whole range. We can be serious. I mean, we entered into worship together as a family. We can be serious. We can pray, believing that God can move mountains. And we can have fun because we know that God created us as people. And he created all of those emotions. He created the serious, the let's get to business and see the world changed for his glory. And we believe that God can use comedy and humor and levity to be able to change the world as well. So we here at C2 believe that God created the whole person all together. He created everything that's within us, and we can use all of that to glorify him. Amen, church? Amen. Well, for those that um, don't know, my name is Matt, uh, Matt Copeland. It is, I love being able to be on staff here at C2. Uh, I was talking to someone this week and came to realize that I've been on staff here now for like eight and a half years. Like, I've been on staff here longer than I've done any other thing consistently in my life. Like, this is the most long-running gig I've had, other than breathe. Breathing, which apparently I forget to do sometimes. Um, so thank you, church, for being for believing in me, investing in me. Um, for those that don't know, uh, married and beautiful wife sitting over here, uh, I'm thankful to be able to be a father myself. Three and a half years ago, um, was able to join the party of fatherhood. Uh, we've got three boys. Elias is three and a half. Titus is 15 months old, and we've got one on the way due in September. Um, and so thank you, church. <clears throat> Thank you for investing in your pastors. I, I just want to take a second to say um, myself, I know that Jeremy and Darcy would say the same, Ben and Linda, Ryan, Jennifer and Matt, Megan and Keenan, um, Deborah and Michael, thank you so much for investing in your staff and believing in us. It helps us. Thank you, Marilyn. <clears throat> It helps us to be able to lead when we know that we're part of a family, that this is the role that God's given us, but we're all doing our part to be a part of what God's doing here at C2 Church. Um, if you've joined us this summer, we're well into our sermon series labeled The Songs That Made Us. So a couple weeks ago, Jeremy kicked off the series. Um, he went old school. He brought out a record player. Who here actually like non... Um, Retro, like who used a record player when it was not retro, like when it was the normal, regular thing. It was funny to me because I, in uh, observing, I try to kind of keep an eye out on things. I saw one of our younger individuals, as Jeremy brought out the record player, uh, she was sharing uh, with someone that had more life experience. Yeah, that's a record player, and it's this big disc, and it goes on this thing, and there's a needle that follows it. And God bless this guy, he was doing great. He, mm hmm, great, that's wonderful. The part that made me chuckle was this younger individual, we'll say high school age, was explaining to this more legacy individual how a record player worked, when I can guarantee that this individual probably at some point had records that were older than this individual that was explaining to them. So again, here at C2, we believe in the value of all generations being able to dive in together. So Jeremy kicked off this series, talked about how worship can help us set a groove in our life and how that groove can be intentional and can be help, helpful uh, in our Christian walk. He went over three points in his message. One, we're created to worship. Two, we're commanded by God to worship. And three, that we as people, we as individuals, and we collectively as a family, as a church, benefit from worship. <clears throat> Last week, we got the privilege to hear uh, one of our very own, a missionary to Africa, share. Uh, I love being able to have Brianna share. Thank you so much for bringing the word. It was a powerful challenge, and I personally just love the authenticity and the, the heart and genuineness that she preached from last week. Uh, one of the things that stood out to me and kind of has been 
uh, one of those nuggets that you just kind of sit and think on. Uh, she said, sometimes we don't realize how God can use what we have. We think too little of ourselves where God has a bigger plan for us. Really powerful point there. Um, the three points that she made during her message were worship helps us to see God's heart, that worship helps us to trust God, and worship helps us to surrender. So today we're continuing in the songs that made us, and we're continuing with that theme, that reality of worship. We know and we see reflected in songs and worship that uh, worship helps us to know that God loves us as a good father. And as a good father, God loves us as we truly are. He loves the real version of ourselves. Now, obviously, this morning is Father's Day. If you hadn't picked that up so far in this service we're going to hit it a few more times. You've got a little more time to be able to catch on that. Now, I want to take a moment and say, please don't tune me out. I know that there are hundreds of thousands of churches all around the world right now talking about Father's Day, and maybe you're sitting there going, that's great, Matt, but my father sucked, and it was really hard. Or I have some negative connotation of viewing God as a father because of how poorly my dad treated me. Or maybe you're sitting there going, that's awesome, let's dive in. I had a great father that was loving and caring and supportive, but he's gone. And that's hard, that's a a difficult moment for me. Or maybe you're sitting here going, me and my dad have an estranged relationship and it's really hard for me to even think about father because it sends me into a a poor or a bad uh, mental place. I want to encourage you. Set that aside. Set those negative connotations or negative expectations to the side and listen to what the Holy Spirit's teaching you. Listen to what the Holy Spirit can say this morning. I truly believe that there's something in what God has prepared this morning for every one of us. So if we set those negative ideas and frustrations aside, I really think that God can speak to every one of us this morning. Uh, A few weeks ago, I got the opportunity to be a part of a foster care conference. Um, One of my favorite things, absolute favorite things, as being involved with community outreach is I get to go out and be a part of several different organizations and people that are making godly positive impact in our community. So one of these opportunities was a foster care conference. And just a a quick kind of side note, foster care and adoption is one of the most powerful ways that we as Christians can show the love of God in our world around us. I I firmly believe that when we love kids that have been neglected and set aside with the love of the Father, it will change the trajectory of our nation. So if you're sitting here and going, hmm, pray about it. Ask God, what can you do if I step into the foster care realm? There are several opportunities from adopting someone to fostering many kids to being a a CASA, a court-appointed special advocate, to helping and supporting foster families that we as a Christian family, loving people, can change the trajectory of a child's life and children's lives for eternity when we love them in real ways. If that's you and God's tugging on any heartstring at all, please come talk to me, send me an email, and we'll make sure to get you connected because we've got some great opportunities to be able to love those kids in good ways. So at this conference, they pointed out that fatherlessness is actually one of three main um, factors that they look at for kids at risk. Um, I think it's something that if you've really kind of looked at culture at all, we know that fatherless homes is a, is a big problem. It's a really difficult reality that we find ourselves in. And so I looked up a few of the statistics, and they can be a little um, alarming. Number one, 90% of all homeless and runaway children are from fatherless homes. That's 32 times the average. Next one, 85% of all children who show behavior disorders come from fatherless homes. 20 times the average. Next one. Children who live in a single-parent home are two times more likely to commit suicide than children in a two-parent home. Now, these points didn't say that it was a quality two-parent home. They didn't say it was quality, Father, but just simply that reality of a father being present in the home makes an eternal difference for the lives of children and the lives of the entire family unit. Now, this last one, I think, is actually kind of encouraging. It says 72% of Americans believe that a fatherless home is the most significant social problem and family problem facing their country. Now, I read this and go, look at the opportunity 
that if we get men to cling to and understand who God has created them as men to be, we can change the trajectory of our nation. This morning, I am unashamedly speaking to men and to fathers. Now, I pray that everyone here, single moms, you're doing great. Keep doing what you're doing. If there's not a father present, if your dad passed away, there's something here for you. But we intentionally are speaking to fathers this morning because we believe there's work to be done and lives can be changed if we submit to who God calls us to be. Amen, church? Now, this is meant to be an encouragement when we hear these statistics to see how powerful an active and loving father can be in the lives of children. <clears throat> now, I, I mentioned I've got uh, three boys. One's on the way. Um, I think that still counts. The life is growing in there. So, I've got three boys. Um, so, as a father, it's been a journey just to be able to see and kind of realize how... <laughs> heartfelt the role of a father can be. That, I mean, I think that I was a good person before. I was caring and helpful and loving. But to have these little boys that I get an integral part to form and to shape them in everything that they do, how they see the world, I get to be a regular part of informing that, to speak into them, to speak life into them, to realize that the words that I have with my sons are powerful. That when I tell them, you're loving you're caring, you're strong, to be able to speak that life into them, that can change then what they do. It's so cool to me. Elias, our oldest, will have a a moment that he knew he was supposed to do something, but he did it, he he chose the wrong option, whether it's impulse or whatever, and to see the hope in his face when instead of berating him, I call out the goodness that I see in him as a son to be able to bring him up to the next level also reminds me of the power of our words that if we go the opposite direction, that if we discourage, that if we talk negatively, that if we accuse, that we can tear someone down and we can break someone down. Now, I see that myself, even as a limited, finite, broken, personally still figuring all this thing called life out, if I want to have good things and be able to bless my kids in great ways, how much more does our perfect, omniscient, omnipotent Father want for us? Matthew 7, Matthew chapter 7, verses 7 through 11. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. And the one who seeks, finds. And to the one who knocks, it will be opened. For which one of you, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? If he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then who are evil, if you then who are broken people, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who who ask him. We see that this is just one of many promises in scripture that when we go to our father with a true, honest, God-honoring request, there's nothing holding that back. That when we pursue God with all of who we are, he has the world literally to give us. Now here at C2, we subscribe to scripture. We believe that everything we need for life is contained in the word of God, that we might not understand it at times, it might be confusing, but when we dive in and understand context, when we understand the intent and the purpose behind scripture, that it can inform all of who we are, and that's what we submit to. We submit to the authority of scripture. And in God's word, we see from beginning to end that scripture tells the story of God as a loving father that wants to have relationship with us as his children. Now, if we take a minute to really think about it, one, God created us. Like, God created humanity. He breathed life into us. We kind of went astray and broke it. And then again, God saw us in our brokenness and said, it's not good that man should have to figure it out on their own. I created them in the beginning. I tried to have a relationship with them. They didn't get it. I'm going to send my son. So again, in in our story, God entered in to be able to give us a good gift that would bring freedom, that would bring new life. Through all the story of Scripture, we see that God is loving and wants and covets a caring and perfect as in whole, not perfect as in no problem, but perfect as in whole relationship with us as his beloved children. He wants the best for us. 
<clears throat> as a good father, God loves us as we truly are. The best gift of God is his love for us. When we read scripture, we understand that God as a being is love. Now, where we can get kind of confused sometimes, it, it, a good way of seeing it, we exist in two dimensions. God exists in three dimensions. If you can picture that, if we're trying two-dimensionally to understand a three-dimensional God, it can get confusing, and our minds kind of short-circuit sometimes. So with that example, we see God loves us, but God doesn't love us the way the world tells us love works. God loves us in the way that is perfect and true and complete and whole love. And so we try, through reading Scripture, to be able to understand that perfect, empowering love for us as his people, for us as his children and his creation. And in that love, in that care and compassion, God speaks into us who we are. We see from the beginning that Adam was created by the breath of God. When we allow God to be able to speak into us, that breath empowers us to live the life he's called us, he's commanded, and he wants for us to live. God calls out the good and he shapes us with his very words. Ephesians 2.10, for we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so that we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. God created us to be whole. God created us with everything that we need through relationship with him. But sometimes that's the hardest part, accepting who God says we are rather than who we doubt ourselves to be or rather than doubting the lies that get sent our way. The doubt is so easy, easy to grab onto. That's great what the Bible says, that God loves us no matter where we find ourselves, that God loves us no matter what we've done. But God doesn't understand the reality, the depth of my inadequacy. God doesn't understand how broken I am, the decisions I've made that have pulled me away from him. When we allow other things and other sources to define us rather than who God says we are, we get scared, lost, and lonely. Those aren't words that any man wants to use to describe themselves. But when we get distracted, when we get pulled away by the lies of the enemy, or just even lies and doubts within our own mind, we get lost, we get scared, and we get afraid that maybe I don't have enough. Maybe where I'm at can't work. But God promises that when we cling to his definition, when we come and submit to him as God to him as God and King and Lord of our lives, that he has all that we need. Just as it said earlier in Matthew, that God has good gifts, and all we have to do is ask, and he'll give us those good gifts. The dangers of listening to our own broken thoughts or the thoughts around us are sometimes life and death. And not I don't say that to be scary, but when we get trapped down the wrong path of believing our own self-thought and our own self-talk, it can send us down a really scary way that leads fathers to leave the home. I can't do this. My family's better off without me. Or maybe the dad's present, but he's checked out. Like he's there, but he's not actively a part of the family's life. So instead of getting stuck in our own way of thought, we submit to God's truth and reality for who we are. We can't support ourselves alone. We were never able, we were never meant to be able to come up with our own definition and empower ourselves by ourselves that just enough good self-talk and we'll be good for the day. Good self-talk is allowing God to inform our self-talk. We have to be rooted and grounded in God. So this morning, um, I'm going to use a visual aid to be able to tell some of this story. Uh, Skit Guys is a, I don't know, video production people. Um, they're great. So I'm going to go ahead and queue up a video for that. This video is called God's Chisel. Uh, it's got a little bit to it. And so if you want, go ahead and take notes to keep yourself engaged. And whenever it's done, uh, we'll keep going through it. Hazzy, can you play that? Thank you. Ephesians 2.10 says that we're God's workmanship, his masterpiece. I don't know about you, but when I get up in the morning and look in the mirror, I don't really see a, a masterpiece, you know? I mean, maybe a Picasso. It's like... <laughs> But I want to be his masterpiece. I want to be everything he created me to be. And so I go to him in prayer and I say, Dear Heavenly Father, do whatever it takes to mold.
mold me into the image of your son. Make me your masterpiece. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Hi. Whoa. Who are you? I'm God. You said the prayer, so here I am. You're not God. No, I am. You said the prayer. That's how it works. Okay, okay. If you're God, then uh, make it snow in here. You know what? I really don't want to make it snow in here because it'd get kind of yucky. Yeah, you're not God. Why do you say that? God wouldn't say yucky. I do. It's a Greek word. Oh. oh okay, okay. Um, if you're God, what does Lamentations 15.9 say? Lamentations is only five chapters. It's a very short book. Oh. Why was it so short? I was tired of lamenting. Oh. Okay, okay. If you're God, who's going to win the World Series this year? I'm really not into playing games. Why are you so much into playing games? You are God. What gave it away? You answered my question with a question. I did? <laughs> yeah, I do that. Don't I? I did it again. <laughs> Step right up. Here we go. Okay. All right. Hey, what are we doing? I'm going to make you my original masterpiece. This is the process. Oh, okay. Got it. Yeah. Wait, wait. What are these about? These are the tools I'm going to use to make you into my original masterpiece. Okay. Yeah. Hang on. Yeah. I thought you were a carpenter. That's my son. Step right up. Here we go. Okay. Oh, hey, God. Mm -hmm. How do you know what to chisel away and what to leave? I take out everything in your life that doesn't belong there, kind of like dead weight. Ooh, speaking of dead weight, could you chisel right here? It showed up when I was in my 20s and grew around and became back fat. I don't even know why you created that, but I can't get rid of it. I mean, I've tried everything. Like, I tried running. I tried lifting weights. My wife actually talked me into trying Pilates. That was awkward. But I can't get rid of it. So if you would just chisel around here, and then, you know what, if you chisel a line right here and maybe... Four to five, maybe eight lines right here. That would be awesome. You're funny. You made me that way. I also made the platypus. The platypus? All I'm saying is most of my children, when it comes to this process, they just want to talk, but they don't want to do the work. So do you want to talk or can I chisel? Talk, chisel. No, talk, no, chisel. no, 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 no. I choose to chisel. All right. Through my Holy Spirit, I'm going to bring up things in your life that I want you to work on. Like your anger. I created the emotion, but you use it in the wrong way. Um, you compare yourself to others instead of me. You tell little white lies because you want to people please. You're lazy. But you try to fool everybody by looking really, really busy. You have a problem with lust? Well, time out. <laughs> I don't really have a problem with lust. You don't have a problem with lust. No, I can do it anytime I want. <sighs> Hang on a second. I mean, I, I got to admit, I, I feel like you've been doing some great work, and I'm looking pretty good right now. All right, when you look in the mirror, who do you see? I see me. Okay, then I need to keep chiseling away because ultimately you and other people need to see my son. Okay, don't misunderstand me. It's just um, when I look more like Jesus, people get uncomfortable around me. I mean, even my church friends, and they're like, oh, you're holier than thou, you know? And, and I, don't, I don't think I'm supposed to make people uncomfortable. So what you're saying is you'd rather play God in certain areas of your life than for me to be God over your whole life. That is not what I said. It's what you meant. Yes, it is. Um, it's hard to talk to you. You know everything that I'm thinking. I'm just saying you've done some great work. Maybe we take a break, a sabbatical from each other, you know. I'll stay right here and then, you That's know. That's just it. You never just stay right there. You're either moving toward me or away from me, but never you just stay. What you're doing is called control. Do you want to control things in your life or can I chisel? Control, chisel, control, no, chisel. No, chisel, chisel. All right. But can we chisel where I want? That's called control. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Now this right here, this secret sin that you keep running to whenever you're hurting, angry, lonely, tired, that you think you're fooling everybody, but it's making you a whitewashed tomb. Are you ready for me to chisel this out of your life? Yeah. You see, it's a process. It's not a sprint. It's a marathon. It's your whole life. And you care so deeply about what other people think of you. It's rubbish. It's garbage. The greatest thing you're ever going to hear is at the end of your life when you hear me say, well done, good and faithful servant. That's what you keep your eye on. That's the prize. Heavenward. Oh, that hurts. Oh, trust me. This hurts me more than it hurts you. Right. Okay. I'm sorry. I just, I don't think you understand this pain. Pardon me? You're asking me to sacrifice a lot, God. Don't talk to me about sacrifice. I know all about sacrifice. I sent my son to die on the cross for pain, for sin, but I also did it for another reason, to give you freedom. 
Do you know what insanity is? Insanity is doing the same thing over and over and over again, expecting different results. And there are things that you've been doing for years, these empty wells that don't have anything to offer. You've been going to them and it's insane. Allow me to chisel them out of your life. Um, allow me to produce character when you keep focusing so much on your image. Okay, but I was thinking. Your thoughts are not my thoughts. Okay, but if we went another way. Your ways could, are not oh, my ways. Oh, I can't. You can't what? I, I, I can't be good. That's your excuse. That's your excuse is that you can't be good. It's not an excuse. I can't. Oh, my child. In the beginning. I said it was good. I made you good. Be good. Yeah, but you and I both... What? Nothing. No, what is it? Nothing, okay? You wouldn't understand. I, God of all the universe, wouldn't understand something one of my children has to say. Try me. It's just, uh... I let you down so many times, God. No, my child. You were never holding me up. I hold you up with my victorious, righteous right hand. Never the other way around. In this relationship, I hold you up. Okay. And chisel away. But just, just be prepared for what you're going to find in there. Because I know who's inside there. Because I get up every morning... And I look at him in the mirror, and I hate who I see. Because deep inside there, this 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 little kid who gets up every morning and dresses like an adult, and I go out and I, and I, I try to do what I'm supposed to do, but I can't. Okay, I can't be who everybody else expects me to be. God, I can't even be who I want to be, much less who you created me to be. And so inside is this scared, stupid little kid. But you chisel away, just. Be prepared. You have listened to so many voices for far too long that were not from me. And you have totally bought into the lie, haven't you? You think you're junk, don't you? When you lay your head down at night after you've done the dance to get the hug, you think you're junk. Listen to me. I don't take time to make junk. How can I show you that my love for you stretches as far as the east to the west? That How can I show you that my love for you has no end? I know. Reach in your back pocket. What? Reach in your back pocket. Why? Are you arguing with me? Reach in your back pocket. Oh, God. Yes? I just went, God, I'll do that right now. You're just saying my name in vain. Come on. It's, it's a name. It's a saying. It's a name above all names. It's more than a saying. It's more than a name. I want to teach you something about my name. Reach in your back pocket. Oh, my God. You know what that is? Yeah, it's a, uh, it, it's a note. I, I wrote it when I was in college. How did you get this? Hello? Oh, yeah. Go ahead and read it. I love Angie. Other side. Sorry. Dear God, did I hear you right today? Did I hear you say that you love me? Even though you and I both know I've messed up so many times. Did I hear you say you want to use me? And I feel so useless. If you'll take me, then use me. Then, God, I give you all that I am. Take me. I love you, God. I love you too. And I love you too much just to leave you where you're at. This salvation that you hold, I don't want it to be some sentimental gush or some head knowledge. I want you to work it out in every detail of your life. And when problems come and chaos happens, don't look at that as a, as a prison, but look at it as a father disciplines his child. A father disciplines the ones he loves. I know, but it's going to be tough. Yes, but you bought into the lie thinking everything was going to be easy when you gave everything over to me. There will be trouble in this world, but they have good cheer. I've overcome the world. 
I want you to do something. I want you to look out there and I want you to say, Tommy is God's original masterpiece. Tommy is God's. No, not the way you see yourself or you try so desperately for others to see you, but maybe for the first time in your life, the way I see you, the way I created you. Tommy is God's original masterpiece. Yes, you are. And so are you. God doesn't make junk. You are an original masterpiece. So I'm not going to repeat all of what that video has to say. Um, I could probably sit here and watch it a dozen times over to be able to continue to hear what the gentlemen in that video, what they're saying isn't just some gushy feel-good. Everything of what they said is based in Scripture. There's actually several of what they say that are straight-up Bible verses that they're quoting. I actually have this video saved. It's on my YouTube. Because I know sometimes it's easy to hear or to feel the lies all around us, whether it's from myself, Matt, you messed up, you missed it, it didn't work. Or whether it's from the world around us, men aren't needed, men aren't a valued part of a society, they're the ones that broke everything. Whatever it may be, stop clinging to the lies from the enemy and instead cling to who God made you as a father and as a man and claim your mantle to see leadership change your family. What are godly attributes of manliness? 1 Timothy 6, 11 through 12. But as for you, O man of God, this is from Paul writing to Timothy. But as for you, O man of God, flee these things. He's speaking of greed and immorality that he talked about before. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you are called. Our purpose is here and beyond. Our purpose is more than just the fallible, physical things that we deal with. We interact on a, on a spiritual and depth of reality. Men, I want you to listen to these. Doubt says that you're too messed up. God says that you're in your right relationship with him and others by the gift of his son. Fear says that it won't work out and that you can't do it. Faith says that God's on your side. Pride says that you can't count on anyone. You got to do it all by yourself. Love says that those around you are worth the effort. Weariness says that the good isn't worth it. Perseverance shows that God always stays, stays true to his promises. The world says, take what you want. You're the most important thing. Gentleness knows that we do our best by serving one another. Now, I can't speak to men and I can't point out what godly manliness looks like without taking time to take a little bit on servanthood. Jesus, as the perfect example of God in the flesh, his whole life, the very fact that he came and lived as a man, is a testament to servanthood. God, as king of the universe, lowered himself, humbled himself. By the way, humility isn't thinking less of ourselves. Humility is thinking of ourselves in correct context of who God says we are. We're not proud and we're also not ashamed, but we understand that we're co-heirs, we're created beings to do God's goodwill in the world around us. Jesus came and lived a humble life as a servant. Who are we to think that we can do any less than serve those around us? Men, I encourage you, take the opportunity to serve because that's when your leadership will be at its best. Take the opportunity to change that middle-of-the-night poopy diaper that no one wants to deal and no one wants to do with. You might think, Matt, that's a minor thing. Take the opportunity to do the dishes because they stacked up and family's having a hard day. 
Take the opportunity to take that job or that responsibility at work that no one else wants to do and do it with joy and submission because we know that when we serve, it is a godly command. Matthew 23, 12. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. Whenever we submit and humble ourselves to the status of servanthood, that God will write our story, that God will take care of us. And man, I promise that when we serve in a godly capacity and a godly reality, that it will Will change the world around us. Now you might say, so Matt, that's good ideas, but how does that work? What are the practical steps to be able to get there? Actually, I preached a message a month ago um, that was about identity. If you go and look back, there's probably some similarities in these two uh, messages because I believe there's something really important that God's trying to teach us. And the practical steps of how do we do this are the exact same as they were a month ago. Not because there's anything unique about them, but because they're the God-given mandates to be able to walk out lives as Christians. One, regular time with God. Spend time worshiping the God of the universe. Two, know scripture. Know what God says about you. Men, know who God says you are, that you are an overcomer, that you are co-heir with Christ, that God set you as the leader of your family, so lead with morality and with purpose. And then number three, share life with God-seeking people that can lift and encourage. There's not enough men that are submitted to godly accountability to be able to encourage and build one another up and to be able to call out and say, dude, I love you. You're missing the mark. Like somewhere it went off. How can I walk beside you to help see that we're submitted to who God has called us to be as men, as leaders, and as followers of Christ? As a good father, God loves us as we truly are. I believe with every part of me that when we see men of God rise up and claim the godly picture of manliness, the godly picture of fatherhood, that it will change our world. I believe that it will change our family, that we'll be in right relationship with our spouses, that we'll be able to encourage our kids and point them in a direction that leads to God's throne. I believe that it will change our churches, that we'll see churches that are empowered because the men know that this world is for us to be on mission for God and that we, when we cling to and we understand that godly drive of uh, servanthood, that it'll change how our churches interact. I believe that when our churches are active and alive and thriving, that it'll change our community. And when the power of the church is unleashed in our community, it'll change the world forever. As a good father, God loves us as we are. Men, fathers, God loves you as and where you are. Now, as pointed out in the video, he doesn't want to leave you there, that there's the reality of understanding his vision, his image of who you are, rather than the the cheapened vision we sometimes see, but God loves us as we are. It's tough. We know that there will be challenges, and I'm not here to pretend that, well, if you just cling to God, then everything will work out. Simple. Everything will work out, but there's going to be difficult times to to see that come to fruition. God longs for us to come back to our true identity, and I can promise you that no matter how challenging it may be, God will never give up on you. That as long as we keep that hand connected, and sometimes even if we don't believe it, as long as we leave that hand connected to the Father, that he'll make it work. That he'll he'll lead us through and make it a point to lead us where we need to be. I'm going to take a time this, moment, this morning to pray for men, to pray for fathers. Because again, we believe that when men claim who God says they are, it, it will change the world. Let's pray this morning. Father God, I thank you for the opportunity to be able to share this morning. God, I pray specifically for the men and for the fathers in this room. God, I, I pray shield. I pray a barrier of protection. God, that whatever lies come toward us, God, whether it be lies from family, whether it be lies from culture, whether it be lies within our own self, within our own head, God, I ask that you would, there would be a barrier of protection of the men of this church, that those lies would not be able to stick. God, that they would be thrown and they would bounce off. God, that we would be able to know who we are as men of the word as men of, as godly men, 
And God, that that is how we would move forward. God, that we would be empowered by your Holy Spirit. We would be servants of those around us and that that reality would be what we cling to. God, not the lies of the enemy, not the lies or frailties of culture, but God, that we would cling to who you say we are, that we would stake everything at the foot of the cross to say, the doubts I have aren't worth anything because I know my God believes in me that the doubts that I feel, the fear that I have, the failure that I'm afraid of isn't anything because I know that God says I'm an overcomer, that God says that he's for me and he will never leave me and never forsake me. God, I ask that men in this room would be able to understand and you would work in our hearts, work in my heart, Father, for us to know who you've called us to be as your children, as your sons.